So now let's look at several algebraic properties of the respective TI matrix in the trifocal tensor. It will be evident that each of these 3 by 3 TI matrix has a rank of 2. This is because we've seen earlier on that uh, the TI matrix is made up of the sum of two outer products. And in the earlier lecture, we said that the sum of two outer product terms uh, will form a rank deficient uh, matrix. Uh, in, in this case, it is a rank 2 matrix. And in the earlier slides where we look at uh, the epipolar lines and the epipoles from trifocal tensor, we saw that the right now space of Ti, where i here equals to 1, 2, or 3, it's the epipolar line in the third view that corresponds to the point x equals to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 in the first view, respectively. And the epipolar line L prime prime in the third view it's given by the cross product of the epipole denoted by E prime prime and the respective column of the camera matrix in the third view. Uh, if you recall earlier on, we defined that P prime prime the camera matrix is equals to B and B four over here, where B over here can be rewritten as B one, B two, and B three and then B4 over here. So here's the proof on why this is true. Uh, recall in the earlier lecture when we talk about fundamental matrix that the epipolar line is given by L prime prime equals to the projection of the camera center in the first image onto the third image or onto the second image here. So uh, in another, this is my first view, which I denote the camera center as C and the projection matrix here is P equals to one I identity and zero. And then this is my third view over here where I denote the camera center as C prime prime and the projection matrix as P prime prime over here, which is given by uh, B1, B2, B3, and B4 as mentioned earlier on here. So the epipole would be the projection of the first camera center into the third view over here and that would be given by uh, p prime prime multiplied by c over here and the epipolar line would be given by this first term cross product with the second term over here which is defined by p prime prime that's the camera projection matrix of the third view and the pseudo inverse of the first uh, camera projection matrix multiplied by the point x in the first view over here. So the pseudo inverse here is defined as the pseudo inverse multiplied by p, which is the original uh, camera matrix has to be equals to identity over here. And here we can see that this guy over here is simply the transpose of the uh, projection matrix, which is defined in the canonical frame, which is given by this guy over here. So it's a four by three matrix where the first three by three entries is an identity and the last row is simply a zero. And so evaluating this particular term over here, we see that the epipole remains over here, uh, taking the product of the camera projection matrix and this, the, uh, the pseudo inverse of the camera projection matrix in the first frame, we, we see that uh, essentially the last row of zero here causes the last column in the camera projection matrix to drop out. Hence, we are left with B1, B2, and uh, B3 uh, in, uh, over here. And now, uh, if in the case where we know that X is going to be defined by either one of these uh, three points, uh, notice that because uh, there's only one entries in all these three choices that corresponds to one, and the rest are zero. So this can be simply seen as a selector of the columns of this uh, camera projection matrix over here. Hence, we are going to rewrite this uh, product over here, B1, B2, B3, multiply by X into uh, BI over here. We'll use LI prime prime here to denote the epipolar line that corresponds to the ith uh, point in the first view. And we also learned earlier on that the epipole in the third view is the common intersection of the epipolar lines uh, 
L prime prime of I, where I equals to 1, 2, and 3 defined by these three respective points over here. So what it means is that uh, the epipolar line, I have three different points over here, and these three different points, it's going to be transferred from the first view into the third view as three different epipolar lines. And the intersection of these three epipolar lines over here, which I call L prime prime one, L prime prime two, and L prime prime three, they are going to intersect at the epipole denoted by E prime prime over here. And this particular epipole can be computed as the left now space of the matrix that is being formed uh, by a simple concatenation of the three epipolar lines L, I, prime prime over here. So similarly, the left now space uh, of the TI matrix gives the epipolar line in the second view that corresponds to the points of uh, x equals to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. I will not derive this, it's simply following this particular proof here. You should try it for yourself. Now, similarly, the epipole in the second view is the common intersection of the three epipolar lines that was found earlier on. So what this means is that I have my first view over here and I have three points denoted by these three sets of coordinates over here. And in the second view, uh, these three points transfers to three epipolar lines which intersects at a uh, certain point over here and this particular point would be my epipole in the second view which I denote as E prime and similarly this common intersection can be found as the left now space of the three epipolar lines in the second view that are concatenated together to form the matrix uh, over here. Now the epipoles and the epipolar line that was mentioned earlier on can be directly obtained uh, from the TI matrix because of the special configuration of this particular uh, three points over here. We select it such that it becomes a selector of the uh, TI matrix in the uh, trifocal tensor. But the relation still works in general. So what this means is that uh, we can generally call the uh, a matrix, which we denote as M over here, as the equation of uh, the, the sum of the xi, which is the point, the ith coordinate of the point. So x1, x2, and x3 over here. And this respective coordinate multiplied by the respective 3 by 3 a matrix over here. So the, it's essentially this particular guy over here becomes x1 multiplied by t1 plus x2 multiplied by t2 plus x3 multiplied by t3. So this relation here can work for any general point on the first image. It need not necessarily be these three special points over here. And M, the M matrix here, we will see later that this can also be used to compute the epipolar lines as well as the uh, epipole. So here, uh, the first thing to mention here is that this M matrix also has a rank of 2 because what we are doing here is that each one of this x, the coefficient here, x1, x2, and x3, they are scalar co coefficient and uh, it's multiplying by a 3 by 3 matrix that is of rank 2. So now what happens here is that we are summing up three respective matrices. We are doing a weighted sum of three respective uh, mat 3 by 3 matrices, which are all rank 2 respectively. So the sum of it should naturally be still of rank 2. It cannot be any other rank. And similarly, once we uh, found this uh, M matrix over here, we can use this M matrix, which is this guy over here, this relation over here, to find the epipolar line in the third view. This will simply become the right uh, null space equation of this uh, epipolar line in the third view. And the same relation holds for the as the left null space uh, equation to find the epipolar line in the second view. 
So this would also be true. Now let's look at the extraction of fundamental matrices from the trifocal tensor. We know earlier on that a line in the third view, which is denoted by L prime prime over here, induces a homography from the first to the second view, which is given by this equation over here. So here, what it means is that I have the first view over here, and this is a point. I have a second view with a point as well, which I denote as x, x prime over here. And in my third view, I have a line, which I denote by L prime prime over here. I know that this line is going to be back projected as a plane in the 3V space. And the two points over here, the two image points here, they are all going to intersect at a point in the 3D space that sits on the line that projects to this image line in the third view over here. So I denote this uh, line over here as capital L and this point over here as X. Since the 3D point X lies on a plane that projects as a line in the third view over here, what this means is that there is a homography that transfer between the first view from, from a point to another point in the second view given by this equation over here. And this homography transfer is induced by the back projected plane as well as the trifocal tensor given by this guy over here. So this is uh, uh, equivalent to a homography in the first two view. Now, so since we know that a point in the first view denoted by X is transferred to another point via homography in the second view denoted by x prime over here, the corresponding epipolar line can be found by joining the, this transferred point x prime over here with the epipole that is in the second uh, image over here. So, and this can be uh, effectively uh, obtained by the cross product equation over here. So l prime, where this is this guy here, l prime is the epipolar line of the second image of this particular, of the, the point X in the first image that is transferred into the second image over here. So uh, this would be given by, since the two points, the epipole and the transferred point X prime sits on this particular line L prime, epipolar line L prime. So this, the cross product of these two points would give us the epipolar line L prime over here. The first point would be E prime denoted by E prime and cross product by X prime over here, which is the transfer point of the X in the first view to the second view as X prime. And we've seen earlier on that there is a relation over here, which is given by the homography that is given by this guy over here. That is a function of the trifocal tensor as well as the, the line uh, L prime prime in the third view over here. So we can rewrite this equation, the epipolar line L prime into a function of the epipole in the second view, as well as the homograph that transfer the first view to the second view. And now this equation over here, the epipolar line can also be rewritten into this form over here, where we simply group this part out and to into a three by three matrix that we call F21. And now this becomes our familiar equation that we have seen in the previous lecture when we talk about uh, fundamental matrix. Uh, F21 over here would be simply our fundamental matrix that transfer a point in the first view into the epipolar line, which denoted by L prime in the second view over here. And hence we get the relation of the fundamental matrix in terms of the trifocal tensor, the epipole in the second view, and the corresponding line in the third view denoted by L prime prime over here. The formula of the fundamental matrix, in fact, uh, holds for any vector L prime prime. But it's important to note that uh, the choice of L prime has to be done in a way to avoid degeneracy, where L prime actually lies in the null space of any of the uh, TI matrices in the trifocal tensor. What this situation means is that uh, uh, we have seen earlier on when we look at the epipolar line of the three special configuration of the points 1, 0, 0, 
zero one zero and zero zero one. The product of the the epipolar line and this uh, trifocal tensor because it simply means that the epipolar line of the respective point is in the null space of the TI matrix over here. So what we want to do is that we want to avoid this configuration where the product of TI and L prime prime, which is given by th this part of the equation over here, equals to zero. Th th and this arises when L prime prime lies in the null space of TI uh, under this transfer of the three sets of uh, special points over here. When this situation uh, arises, this means that the fundamental matrix between the first two view would be undefined and we call this a degenerate case. So in order to avoid this, uh, since L prime prime here can be any line a, and a good choice of this L prime prime here would be uh, the epipole in the third view, which is, we denote by E prime prime over here. Since the coordinates of this epipole can also be used to denote one of the lines in the third view over here, which we denote as L prime prime over here. The special property about this particular line that is equals to E prime prime over here would be that it is perpendicular to the right now space of the fundamental uh, matrix here. What they, this means is that, let's say that this is the line. For example, that I have a point here, which falls into the degenerate configuration 100, zero, zero, and this transfer to a line over here. And by choosing L prime prime to be E prime prime, what we can do here is that we well, we can be guaranteed that this particular line L prime prime is as far away from this degenerate configuration line as possible, which means that it's directly perpendicular to this particular line over here. So note that a choice of a line that is very close to the degenerate configuration is also no good because what this means is that once we do all this uh, multiplication over here, the fundamental matrix over here would all the entries would end up to be very close to zero and that's uh, not good. So the, the optimal solution over here would be directly a line that is furthest away from the degenerate configuration over here. Let's see why is that, uh, why is it that E prime prime by choosing a line L prime prime to be equals to E prime prime, it will give us the perpendicular line. Uh, to the degenerate configuration. Let's assume that uh, L prime prime is the epipolar line uh, that uh, it has to lie on the right now space of each Ti, which means that we have this guy over here. And E prime prime is perpendicular to the right now space since it lies on L prime prime. So uh, here, let's say, uh, let's see that uh, X here would be any uh, point that is not in this set of configuration. So what we can see here is that uh, since L prime prime here is an epipolar line, it has line on in the right now space of this guy over here, and E prime prime is perpendicular to this right now space since it lies on this this line over here. What it simply means is that I have a line L prime prime and E prime prime is is that line here E prime prime and we know that since E prime prime lies on L prime prime that means that the dot product of E prime prime and L prime prime has to always be equals to zero when I take the dot product of two vectors it is also equals to the magnitude of the two vectors multiplied together and the angle between them so since it always has to be equals to zero, what this means is that this guy here better be equals to zero. And that simply means that data, which means that the angle between the two lines, if I were to say that this line here is equals to E prime prime, the angle of between these two lines, it better be 90 degrees over here. In order for cosine theta to be zero, the dot product to be zero over here. Hence, this gives the uh, solution of the fundamental matrix to be equals to uh, the cross product of the epipole in the second view and the uh, trifocal tensor multiplied by the 
uh, epipole in the third view. So in this particular choice over here, the epipole of the third view, we're guaranteed that F21 will never be in the degenerate uh, configuration. And a similar uh, formulation can also be derived uh, between the third and the first view uh, given by the fundamental matrix over here, F31. So here we can see that uh, the row of E and E prime prime uh, simply uh, is swapped over here and the trifocal tensor we have to take a transpose over here. So I'll leave it to you to uh, derive this equation. It's easy to do that by simply following the sense, uh, same set of derivation that we saw here. Now the next thing that we want to retrieve after retrieving the fundamental matrix would be to recover the camera matrices uh, given by uh, P, P prime and P prime prime for the uh, three respective three views. And since the trifocal tensor expresses a relationship between the images only, so what it means is that we've seen that the incidence relation it's purely relating the image uh, entities uh, correspondences. It could be a point, it could also be a line, it could be everything uh, a line, and it only involves this L L prime and L prime prime as well as T one T two and T3. And this means that the incidence relation is completely independent of the uh, 3D entities uh, in, in 3D space. And this simply means that the, the trifocal tensor is independent of any uh, 3D projective uh, transformation. So conversely, this also implies that the camera matrices here, P, P prime and P prime prime can only be computed up to uh, a projective ambiguity from the trifocal tensor. So due to the projective ambiguity, we can fix the first camera uh, to be in a canonical frame. This means that we are assigning the camera coordinate of the first camera to be aligned with the world frame, which we denote as uh, I over here, which is a three by three identity, and then uh, a zero over here, which is a uh, three by one uh, column of zeros. And since F21 over here, the fundamental matrix that relates the first two view is known from the uh, previous slides, we can make use of this known fundamental matrix over here to define the camera projection matrix P prime uh, in the second view. And this is what we have seen earlier on in the lecture on uh, fundamental matrix, that the fundamental matrix can be uh, written as uh, the cross product of uh, small a and uh, big A over here, where small a is the epipole, uh, it forms the last column of the camera projection matrix. And this A over here, capital A over here, is a three by three matrix that forms the first three by three entries of the camera projection uh, matrix. So this guy over here, these two terms over here, small a and big A over here, can be obtained uh, from the trifocal tensor and the epipose that is computed in the earlier slides here. Now, uh, what this means is that putting all the terms that we have seen earlier on for a, small a and big A over here into the camera projection matrix P prime over here. This is the relation uh, that we will, we will get for the second camera. And uh, what this also means is that the two camera matrices here, P and P prime, will be the camera matrices that has a fundamental matrix co that corresponds to F21 up to a projective ambiguity that we have seen earlier on in the lecture when we talk about uh, fundamental matrix. Now, there is a fallacy here that uh, it might be thought that the third camera uh, could also be chosen in a similar manner. So what this means is that I have three views over here, first, second, and third view. The camera projection matrix would be P, P prime, and P prime prime. So since I, I fixed the first camera uh, matrix as the canonical uh, matrix, and I already chose P prime 
according to this relation over here, the decomposition of the fundamental matrix over here. There is a temptation to choose the third camera matrix over here that relates the first and third camera matrix here. So assuming that I know the fundamental matrix uh, F3i, which uh, can be computed from the earlier uh, slides. Assuming that I know this now, so there is a there is a temptation that I might just simply use the same trick over here to get the uh, results for P prime prime, which we denote as B and uh, B4 over here. So there is a temptation that says that uh, if I have F3 1 and this is going to simply be equals to uh, B4 cross product with B over here. Uh, but this this particular thought over here, which will result in this particular uh, equation of P prime prime from the trifocal tensor relation that uh, we derived earlier on to get the epipoles and the uh, and the epipolar line would be wrong. This is not correct. To see why, uh, let's suppose that a pair of camera uh, matrices P and P prime between the first and second view it's already chosen, which is what we already chose here from the decomposition of the fundamental matrix F21 over here. And suppose that uh, we reconstruct the 3D points over here. So I have my P and P prime, and then I have my correspondence, which is X and X prime over here in these first two views. And we learned earlier on in the uh, lecture on uh, fundamental matrix, the 3D points can be easily recovered from the linear triangulation uh, algorithm where I can get x over here. So once this x is recovered, that means that I have uh, from the first and second view, I have p and I have p prime and then I have x and x prime over here. I'm going to do the linear triangulation to recover this capital X over here. What's interesting here is that once this x is recovered, the third view p prime prime would already be fixed so there won't be any projective ambiguity anymore this is because i have a third correspondence here x prime prime that corresponds to this particular point this particular 3d point that was obtained from uh, linear triangulation of the first two views earlier on and uh, we've seen in the pnp uh, problem earlier on in the last lecture that once this is defined, once the 3D point is defined, there, there is actually no projective ambiguity. What this means is that now once this is defined, P prime prime must have a fixed configuration. We can't choose it with respect to this particular decomposition here anymore because recall that by doing so, this kind of decomposition from the fundamental matrix here, P prime prime and P would be subjected to a projective ambiguity, which is not true in this particular uh, case here, since X has already been defined and there is a direct correspondence. So this means that P prime prime shouldn't have this projective ambiguity anymore. And uh, of course, this is one of the method to recover P prime prime. We can simply do a triangulation, linear triangulation of the point correspondences from the first two view using P and P prime, and then use a P and P to recover the uh, camera projection matrix of the third view. We will show that this is actually unnecessary. We can directly recover this from the trifocal tensor itself. So we have learned in the previous lecture that the fundamental matrix can be decomposed into two pairs of camera matrices denoted by P, P prime and P tilde, P tilde prime respectively. We know that due to the projective ambiguity, the second pair of camera matrices P tilde and P tilde prime can be rewritten in the form of the first pair of camera matrices P and P prime, where the second camera matrix over here, P prime tilde is equals to A plus more A V transpose and lambda A, where V and lambda here, they are some form of vector and a scalar value for the projective ambiguity. And what this means is that since we have seen earlier on that 
the second camera matrix P prime here can be denoted in terms of the tensor T1, T2, T3, and the second epipole, and as well as the first epipole over here. What this means is that the first term over here can be denoted as A, and the second term over here can be denoted as small a over here. And this means that there also exists another pair of uh, fundamental matrix, a general pair of fundamental matrix that has a projective ambiguity. And what this means is that the equivalence of P tilde prime here uh, in a more general form for P prime is actually given by uh, A, which is uh, this guy over here is equivalent to A plus A v transpose where v is some vector form and small a here we have seen here is given by e prime over here so this gives us e prime and v transpose over here and we have also seen that the last column here is given by lambda a and since a is e prime and this would be equivalent to lambda e prime over here and since there is a projective ambiguity uh, between the two views uh, we are free to choose P prime, but we'll see later that we are not free to choose P prime prime as what we have explained earlier on. And we'll see a technique on how to determine it without reconstructing the uh, 3D point. So now, uh, because of this projective ambiguity, we are free to choose the camera projection matrix of the uh, first uh, of the second view, which we denote by P prime. So here, we'll simply ignore this V and uh, lambda and express it as a general form over here, where AI here is given by the uh, product of TI and the epipole. So AI here uh, represents the, it represents every column over here. So this guy over here is every column of this multiplied by E prime prime over here. Now this choice of P prime would immediately fix the projective world frame such that p prime prime is now uniquely defined up to a certain scale as what we have uh, argued earlier on in the uh, description of the fallen c and uh, now what happens here is that we can substitute uh, ai equals to ti uh, e prime prime which is this term over here that we have seen from the first camera projection matrix into the trifocal tensor relation that we have seen uh, earlier on in our derivation to get this particular equation over here. So what this simply means is that I'm going to substitute this guy here into uh, AI over here. And hence I get this term over here uh, in replacement of AI, which follows that I can uh, make E prime BI transpose the subject. So here it becomes apparent that what we are trying to do is that uh, because BI over here defines the second or def it defines the third camera projection matrix which is given by b1 b2 b3 and b4 over here so bi here simply uh, gives us these three terms over here where b4 here uh, it's easy because this is simply the uh, epipole in the third view and uh, here what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to derive the respective column, the first three columns of the camera projection matrix with respect to P prime. That is the second camera projection matrix that we have fixed earlier on. And what this simply means is that uh, we are not no longer arbitrarily uh, choosing uh, the third camera projection matrix uh, is subjected to some form of projective ambiguity. But now we are more uh, careful to solve for this uh, P prime prime over here in terms of the first camera projection matrix because it already fixed the uh, uh, projective frame in the third view. Hence, uh, we are going to make E prime BI transpose here as the subject by moving this over to the left hand side and TI moving it to the right hand side where TI is a common factor here where, which we can factorize out into this form here. Then the next thing that we do here is that since we uh, can choose the scale of the epipole over here to be equals to one, what it simply means is that the dot product of the epipole by itself would be equals to one. Hence, we can simply 
do a multiplication by E prime transpose on both sides of the equation where this term over here becomes 1 and we are left with uh, bi over here and this particular term over here. So now we have defined bi and we can substitute it back into p prime prime where this is equals to b1, b2, b3 and b4 here would be simply the happy pole in the third view and b1, 2 and 3 would be given by the definition here which is given by the choice of the first camera projection matrix here in this case here. So we can see that now uh, so when we fix P prime, which is subjected to a certain projective ambiguity uh, in, in with respect to the first frame. Now, by choosing P prime prime, the entries in P prime prime, according to the choice of P prime, we are no longer subjecting it to a projective ambiguity. We say that by this choice, according to the choice of uh, P prime, we have removed the projective ambiguity from the first two frames to the third frame, which is uh, given by P prime prime over here. Now here's a summary of uh, how we can compute the epipoles E prime, E prime prime in the second and third view respectively from the trifocal tensor. This is what we have seen earlier on. And we also uh, can see that there's a, uh, this is a summary of recovering the fundamental matrices between the first, second view and the first and third view uh, via the trifocal tensor Ti, Ti, T1, T2, and T3 over here. Then finally, we have seen uh, how to recover the camera matrices uh, without falling into the fallen C of the projective ambiguity of the third view uh, using this uh, method over here. We'll now introduce the, the tensor notation to denote the cumbersome uh, three indices uh, in a tensor. Uh, what I meant by cumbersome indices is that uh, we have to represent it in this unconventional way, which is T1, T2, and uh, T3. So now we'll uh, introduce what we call the tensor notation to uh, reformalize this particular uh, notation over here. So as mentioned earlier on, that uh, a image point would be denoted as a homogeneous column of x1, x2, and x3, where this homogeneous column, every entry over here would be denoted by an index of a superscript over here. And uh, we'll do the same for an uh, image line, which is denoted as a homogeneous row over here and we'll use subscripts of 1, 2 and 3 over here to represent the respective coordinates of this particular line over here and we'll use the same denotation for the i by j matrix and where each entry over here is denoted by a subscript j that index the, the column or we call it the covariant index. And I over here, which is the superscript, represents the contravariant, which is the row index of the, of the uh, matrix over here. So what this means is that if I have a matrix A over here, and this particular entry of I and J, so this would uh, be representing the J column and the ith row in the matrix A. Now, this indices repeated in the contravariant and the covariant position. It simply implies the summation over the range of uh, these indices. An example over here is that uh, the this particular transformation equation over here, x prime equals to A, multiply by x over here, where x is a column vector and a here is a matrix. And we'll, the, the multiplication over here, the respective entry in x prime over here. So x prime is equals to uh, 1, x prime 2, and so on and so forth. And x1, uh, x prime 
i for example each one of this i uh, coordinate over here it's simply given by the summation of the i the j entry in the a matrix over here multiply by the j entry of the x vector over here because we have the subscript and the superscript they are the same notation over here so we do a summation over here and this is equivalent to ai uh, 1 multiplied by x1 plus ai uh, 2 multiplied by x2 and so on and so forth we'll drop the summation sign over here uh, by following this rule over here we can see that uh, once we identify that there is a common index between the superscript and the subscript this naturally denote that there should be a summation over uh, j over here but uh, for simplicity we'll just drop the summation sign over here now the trifocal tensor can be also written in the tensor notation using this uh, format over here where we simply use a subscript of i to represent the respective uh, 3 by 3 matrix in the trifocal tensor and the superscript of j and k simply denotes the entry in the row which is j and k is the column so now uh, as we have mentioned earlier on this is a 3 by 3 matrix t1 is a 3 by 3 matrix and then there's another 3 by 3 matrix which we denote as t2 and t3 over here so uh, what it means is that the j row and the k column of ti over here would be this entry over here so we will simply denote this as uh, t i j and k over here now in the tensor notation the basic incidence uh, relation that we have derived earlier on this equation over here which we saw earlier on that this is actually a cumbersome notation we need to write t three times over here t1 t2 t3 and using the uh, square bracket over here this product over here the product of L prime, L prime prime, and T, the trifocal tensor, can be rewritten as this form over here using the uh, tensor notation. So uh, we can see that this Li, that means that the entry, this L transpose over here, uh, the entry L1, L2, and L3 over here, the ith entry over here is simply given by the product of L prime J l prime prime k and t i j and k so we can see following the same rule over here if we see there is a common entry between the subscript and the superscript then that must be a summation over that entry but that particular index and it's uh, applies here similarly so we can see that j is uh, repeated here in the subscript and the superscript and k is also repeated in the subscript and superscript so that this means that there must be two summation sign over j and k over here and uh, interestingly uh, if we look at this equation over here uh, we see that there's no common superscript and subscripts over here so this simply means that this is a scalar product of these two terms over here which corresponds to uh, every entry inside this uh, two outer products uh, in, in the original uh, notation. Now, uh, using the same tensor notation, the homography map that we have seen earlier on here, where we can group this together or this together to form the homography, simply becomes uh, this particular form over here. So here, uh, we can see that the ith k entry of the homography matrix. So homography matrix is actually a, a three by three matrix. So I here, it refers to the column, I have column, uh, and the kth row of this 3x3 three three matrix over here. The, the dot product over here can be rewritten using the tensor notation in this particular form here. And we see that the J index here is common between the subscript and superscript. And this means that there should be a summation sign over here, but we'll drop this summation sign and 
uh, write it simply as this form over here. So uh, similarly, once we have this particular notation over here for the homography, in a tensor notation, we can also use the same notation to denote the uh, mapping uh, of x prime prime equals to h uh, and x over here. So this simply means that this is the kth entry of the column vector of the vector in x prime prime and uh, this is equivalent to the sum over i uh, because there is a common index over here which is i of this uh, homography uh, and uh, element multiplied by the ith coordinate of the point x and uh, here's a summary that how we can use this tensor notation to denote the re relation of the trifocal tensor as well as the definition of all the camera matrices p p prime and p prime prime that we have defined earlier on and similarly we can use the tensor notation to denote the uh, line incidence that we have seen earlier on as well as the homography that transfer the point from the first to the third view via a plane in the second view and the homography that transfer the point from the first to the second view via a plane in the third. Uh, there is an additional tensor uh, notation that we, uh, we will need to introduce and that would be uh, epsilon rst over here. So epsilon rst uh, can be seen as a indicator function where it takes uh, three different states 0 plus 1 or minus 1. So uh, it's 0 when rst contains repeated numbers. An example over here would be epsilon 112 for example and when there's two repeated numbers over here then this will be equals to zero but it would not be equals to zero when uh, all the three numbers here are unique for example epsilon 1 2 and 3. So when there's a even permutation of r s and t over here this means that uh, it's either that uh, the all it remains in order 1 2 and 3 then this would become plus 1 or uh, if there is another even uh, permutation which means that uh, the the numbers are swapped twice so another example here would be epsilon 3 1 and 2 uh, would also be equals to plus 1 this is because we can see that uh, there are uh, even permutation that means that there are uh, we can see that in this example that the numbers are swapped twice, two times, which is an even permutation where the order of 2 and 3 are swapped first. So this is the first swap becomes 1, 3 and 2. And then the second swap would be between 1 and 2 to become 3, 1 and 2 over here. So there are altogether two swaps over here from the original location of 1, 2 and 3 and hence epsilon 3, 1, 2 would be plus 1. So uh, in the case where there is an odd number of permutation between 1, 2 and 3, then epsilon becomes, uh, uh, then epsilon becomes minus 1. So an example would be epsilon 1, 3 and 2. This is going to be equals to minus 1 because uh, 1, 3, 2 is simply a swap between 2 and 3 one time and that would be uh, odd permutation and hence epsilon is going to be uh, minus one over here. So the use of epsilon, the tensor epsilon RST over here would be to define cross product between two vectors. For example, A cross with B and this uh, would end up with another vector C. So where C can be rewritten as C1, C2, C3 for example. And this ci, the i element of uh, the, the resulting vector of the cross product from a and b can be rewritten into this form uh, where epsilon here simply tells you which element of the product between a and b to select as an entry into uh, c, the, the final vector c over here. Similarly, we can also make use of this to represent the skew symmetric matrix of uh, A over here uh, given by I and K. So I and K here represents, this is skew symmetric for example, this is a 3 by 3, 3 by 3 matrix over here. So uh, we can represent this 
uh, using index of i and k where uh, i simply tells you the row index and k simply tells you the column index and this is given by the the expression over here in terms of the epsilon over here so in the case where i and k becomes the superscript then it will no longer be row and column it will be column so i will represent the column and uh, k would represent the row over here and the final expression would be given by this term over here so by making use of epsilon uh, the trifocal tensor of the incidence relation can be rewritten into this uh, forms over here uh, I will leave it to you to figure out that this is uh, correct. For example, uh, you will still follow the same rule where if you see the subscript and the superscript uh, have, having a common uh, indices, then the uh, there will be a summation sign over here. So for example, in this particular case over here, we saw that inside the bracket over here, R is a common uh, in index. So we'll have to sum over R within the bracket over here. And then, uh, once we sum, sum over R, R would uh, go missing, uh, and then we are left with I and S, where I here is common with the I over here. So this means that we have to sum over I, and we can also see that J and K are uh, common subscript and superscript uh, over here. This also means that we have to sum over J and K over here, because we are summing up over R, I, J and K over here, and we are left with S over here. So the final result would be zero because this is an incidence relation. So the final result would be, of course, zero, but uh, it will be a S dimension uh, zeros over here because this is a superscript. So what this means is that zero here is actually a column of there are S number of columns over here. So in this case, S here is from one to N three because this is a trifocal tensor. So similar relation can be observed in all the rest of the relationships over here.